Welcome to Upwards, sponsored by the Microsoft Aspire Experience, where we share stories and insights to help you grow 1% better in your personal and professional life every episode. Here are your hosts for today's episode, Alex Kessel and Zach Zhu. Well, welcome back to another episode of Upwards. Glad to see all the Upwardians, as I have been forced to brand this with. <laughs> out there thanks for joining us i am here with zach zoo we had a great guest this time around pretty interesting topic you want to share a little bit about what we're about to see yeah yeah super interesting conversation from an incredibly intelligent person someone that has uh, had some influence on the both of us throughout our early career so far his name is ted technos he's a senior customer success account manager within the federal space and he has mastered the art of diplomacy, meaning just being able to communicate with people in a tactful way to make sure that everybody is remaining happy and to ensure like the best outcomes, regardless of how difficult of a situation people might be in. So super important topic for most early in career people to learn just because it relates to communication. And I think it'll be a good one for all of y'all to enjoy. Certainly. Let's roll the episode. Today, we are welcomed with a very, very special guest talking about an awesome topic. Introducing Ted Technos, expert in diplomacy. Uh, he's been a CSAM within the federal space for a very, very long time. And from his experience witnessing early in career professionals uh, interact with customers, there has always been a aspect of lacking in the diplomacy department. And uh, as one of uh, the most important soft skills when interacting uh, not only on the job, but within your personal life, uh, we thought Ted would be an excellent guest to help you give us his perspective on diplomacy and how to really master this craft. So thank you for joining us, Ted. Yeah, welcome. Thank you guys for having me. Excited to be here. So I think right off the bat, I know we've had some interactions and I think anyone that's worked with you can kind of see the level of articulation and skill you have at orchestrating a conversation really well. But I think when we're starting to talk about diplomacy, it'd be a really good idea to cover two things here. One, your story and also a definition of diplomacy. So why don't we start off with just a little bit about who you are? Obviously, you're part of the customer success team here, as Zach had mentioned, but tell us a little bit about your story and experience in developing this skill. As you mentioned, I've been in this role at Microsoft for a number of years now. I'm actually coming up on 10 years total here at Microsoft. And actually coming to Microsoft and jumping right into the federal space was my first experience working there. Prior to Microsoft, my focus was solely in commercial. And while I think diplomacy is a skill that kind of applies universally across various jobs and roles and organizations. I didn't see it having as large of a role in commercial as I did when I came into federal. When you come from the commercial space, really, you know, folks kind of understand the leadership structure and, you know, how they align to initiatives that are coming down from their senior leadership. In federal, we live in a world that includes political appointees, and folks whose goals it is to really influence world events. So diplomacy is really everywhere, and it's an art that few have mastered. And coming, as I said, into this space, I recognized that it was a skill that I needed to embrace right from the start. Not having the skill and failing to evolve really was going to affect my ability to kind of grow and drive value for our customers and drive larger strategies and ultimately be able to influence. As I mentioned, coming from the commercial space, it was a little more direct. This is what we want to do, and this is why we're in the federal space. It's a lot about managing relationships and understanding how to influence whatever goals you're trying to achieve. And from your perspective, how would you define diplomacy, and how does it really differ from most of the other soft skills? Generally speaking, it's a skill set focused on navigating situations or even negotiations between sometimes opposing parties while trying to focus on limiting hostility. When you think of diplomacy, I think the first thing that comes to mind is folks in a position of being foreign diplomats, someone that is appointed to represent 
their respective country in foreign affairs, conducting diplomacy on behalf of that country, protecting their interests. That's kind of where the origin of the word comes from. And as I mentioned before, that translates naturally into working in, especially in the federal space, because you're working with groups that many times are focused on opposing perspectives, opposing strategies, and you can walk into a place where you're dealing with a hostile environment, especially coming in from a large vendor like ours, for example. I've worked with a lot of customers that have groups that are, I don't want to say anti-Microsoft, but maybe have had an experience that have made them lean towards using solutions or products from one vendor over another. And that's kind of a good example of where diplomacy is key because you're dealing with parties that aren't necessarily on the same side from the start. Yeah, I think that that covers the level of like tact and cool head that's needed to think about where is the opposition in this situation? Is it towards me? Is it internal towards other folks that I am a third party privy to this and and have to overcome? When we're thinking about building this skill on our own or like, you know, if you want to get better at this, when you find yourself in a moment that your diplomatic spidey senses start tingling, when do you go like, this is what I need to do? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you start realizing that you need to approach something much more diplomatically? I think it's definitely situational. I mean, your approach can differ based on the circumstances. One thing that's important just from the start, and it's not always an option because you might be in the heat of things, but if it's possible, disengage and shift your mind to something different because solutions to complex problems can present themselves a lot easier when you're not focused on it. I find that that's like one of the first things I try to do in that type of situation, if possible. It's not always the case, right? You're in the middle of a situation, you're in the middle of dealing with a crisis, and you're dealing with somebody that's upset, somebody that's frustrated, you have to provide an answer right now. So I think part of it becomes picking and choosing your battles too. You need to understand in that situation where concessions can be made. And also I found being candid can be very helpful. In my role, I find that an example of that would be You know, we're in a situation where something's gone wrong, taking a bit of the blame and saying, I recognize that I could have handled the situation better. We could have communicated this in a different way. Maybe we wouldn't have been in this exact situation if I had done X, Y, and Z to handle it better. Being kind of candid and open about it, I found a lot of times can relax the tension. I can definitely see that because you've got people coming up looking to throw some punches and expecting you to deflect them and justify (laughs) why you didn't or why things did happen the way they are and be, you know, impervious in some sense. So I think that is disarming to do that and helps ease tensions and and open up to like a reconciliatory type conversation. I think what was interesting with you saying like disengaging and stepping back, that reminded me of there was a a study done on creative thinking process and basically having somebody set about a task immediately versus having somebody like play tic-tac-toe with their friend and procrastinate for like 30 minutes and then do the creative task. And they found that the extra time to like percolate on the topic actually resulted in a wider variety of solutions versus the folks that had to do it right away and had no time to really like start thinking about it or just ignore the problem almost all did it the same way and it was like marginally effective. So I think that's a really interesting approach and one that somebody might not take in a heated situation. Do you have a story or an example without giving away information about federal customers, you know, <laughs> either internal or external where something happened and you chose to disengage or there was another moment where you were just like, hey, you know what? This is going to be hard to do, but we're going to navigate this really treacherous waters here. Maybe a story within your early in career phase, just uh, so our audience can relate. Diplomacy is the topic here. And I think I mentioned about the importance of leveraging diplomacy to influence situations. And I can think of many stories, but even a more specific one where this was important. So we work for Microsoft and we have certain things depending on the role that we're there to drive value. And we're, you know, we're also looking to help modernize the customer, take advantage of the great services and products that we offer as a company. And you can talk about a situation where we're talking with the business decision maker about procuring a new product or service and or even enabling capability of something that they already own. And 
I was met with that immediate pushback. You know, I don't have the resources to onboard this. I don't have the budget for this. My team is not trained to handle this. So I think early in your career, your thought process and how to handle that is, well, how do I bring them over to my side? How do I address their concerns? Whether it's cost, whether it's resources, training. So you might come to the table with some additional information and say, okay, well, have you considered this? Have you considered this? But ultimately, you may find yourself with an audience that is just not receptive, regardless of how you shift your communication style, shift what you're delivering. You just may hit that So how do you address it? An example, a strategy that I've used that works a lot in those situations is leveraging your network to identify groups or parties outside of that direct customer that you're engaging with that are influencers. So in this specific example, but many examples like this, leveraging my network, I identified folks that would benefit from this product, but weren't in a position to make a decision about it. But they were people that were very well respected and could influence a decision. So I shifted my focus to that group and said, look, I know you see the benefit of this. These are the other things that you may not even be considering. How do we partner together to get that messaging back to the business decision makers that are actually going to make the call on whether or not we're going to move forward with this? And that's ultimately proved to be very successful. So it kind of shifts your perspective. Instead of attacking it directly, you take that kind of roundabout approach and kind of influence the circle around those people instead of going directly at the target. And we have circled back to networking. (laughs) (laughs) The core topic that has never been talked about. Yeah, building your network in any role is a key skill set. We talked a lot about building relationships. And that's what it is. Remembering when I talk to Alex or when I talk to Zach, you guys are a great resource for X, Y, and Z. Knowing that I can reach back to you to get guidance or advice or assistance with something. And the more you build your network, the easier it's going to make your professional life within this. So if we're talking specifically in the federal space as an example, there may be folks that I've engaged with on a daily basis that weren't in a position to be influential but I still built a relationship with them, maintained that. And over time, they may have shifted into a role that was very influential. They may have shifted to a different position altogether or to a different federal agency, which opens up additional opportunities. So over time, you start realizing, okay, the sprawl of my network is not just this inner circle that I engage with every day, but it it can span a very large space. It's worth making the investment because you don't know where it's going to go, but you're going to be able to leverage it in the future. I've experienced many times folks that I worked with, uh, you know, within services now are on the product side and can really help serve as an escalation point. And together, you end up making the product better because you have a direct line to product owners and you can get feedback from the field that they may not have access to anymore. And then you have a friend in the product group that can help when you're dealing with issues on that specific product. What do you do when you're interacting with a customer? And just from like an objective standpoint, you've done pretty much everything that you could do right. And the only reason why your customer or the people that you're working with are in a hard place is because of them and and their actions in particular. That's a situation that I feel like I deal with on a daily basis <laughs> in this role. As CSAMs, we're doing what we can to drive our customers to help modernize, to help improve their processes. And in a lot of situations, they're stuck in their old mindset and they're not really willing to evolve. So there's a lot of situations like that where you've done what you can to communicate. And no matter what, the customer is not willing to except that some fault falls to them and that there was a better way they could have handled it. So it also really depends on who you're speaking with. I think one of the critical things when talking with folks and this key in a soft skill is identifying communication styles and personalities because you really have to shift and tailor your messaging to the audience. If you're somebody that communicates in a very specific way, that may only resonate with a small percentage of the folks you're dealing with. So if you're dealing with somebody who's very hard-headed and not willing to make concessions on certain things, that may be the opportunity for you to just be quiet, let them vent. 
air their frustrations. As I mentioned before, be candid and accept fault where you can and take that as an opportunity to revisit the conversation later, maybe when things have cooled off, to say, hey, I've thought about this, the things that we talked about, and here's maybe a better strategy for how we can proactively address something like this in the future. Yeah, I think that communication style identification is very important. So how long did it take for you to start to pick up on those styles? Have you kind of always been able to pick up on those communication styles? Or was that really something that you learned while going through the role? That is absolutely something that was learned. You know, there are some folks that I think are very skilled at doing that. Having spoken to both of you before, I think that's a skill that you guys seem to maybe have naturally. But it it is 100% not a skill I used to have. I've given multiple examples of being candid, and that's a default position for me because I'm very direct. I've always been that way. This is how we should do something, and this is why, and it just makes sense to me. But not everyone responds to that. So I just found over time that I had to alter how I delivered information and then started to recognize different patterns and how different folks received what I was communicating that helped me start to develop that skill. It's something that I'm continuing to develop. There are folks you're going to talk to that are hard to read. So it may take time. You may have to build rapport with them in order to really, you know, peel back the layers of the onion and understand who they are and how you can message something in a way that resonates with them. So I'm continuing to evolve, I think. And that's a skill set that everyone that needs to have it will continue to evolve through their experiences. Yeah, that definitely requires a lot of uh, next level emotional intelligence overall to be in that space where you've done your best effort and somebody's uh, thrown it right back in your face and you're just like, okay, I'm going to take it for right now, but in the long run, this is what's going to be best for the relationship moving forward. And talking about that rigidity and especially with how we emphasize the growth mindset so much at Microsoft. Would love for you to kind of touch on your experience of witnessing many early in career professionals that you have worked with in the past who have made some of these critical mistakes in regards to diplomacy and interacting with the customer. Because of course, we're all new in our career and diplomacy is a very, very nuanced and subjective topic to kind of like put within your tool belt. And um, it would be really cool to have our early in career audience have like a little bit more of a heads up and like, oh, I really need to be developing the skill if I'm going into this job. Yeah, I'll do what I can to address that. Because as you mentioned, it's some folks have these types of abilities just natively. They know how to communicate in a way. We've known these people growing up that just seem to connect with everybody, but not everyone is like that. And I find, especially in the tech world, when you're dealing with incredibly intelligent, analytical, detail-oriented people, especially in technical roles, you'll find early at Microsoft, that is the default position of folks that are that intelligent and technical, is to just have that direct approach, be very much about the facts, very data-driven. And that's one of the early mistakes that I made because I came in not as an account manager, but I came in as a consultant. I was very technical and was um, spending probably the first year and a half traveling to different customers for short-term engagement. So I had to learn quickly how to build rapport and shift how I was delivering. And I don't want to take credit that I was able to just identify this stuff myself. I think these things come with time, with experience, but also having a good mentor, I think is critical. Early in your career, finding mentors that that exhibit the skill sets that you want to strive towards is key. And that can be as easy as you're on a team where you see somebody that is just a rock star, amazing at presentations, knows how to deliver succinct information in a way that is clear and concise and everyone understands, or you may be lucky enough to have a mentor assigned to you. I think that's something that even today, 10 years into my career at Microsoft and 20 years into my career in IT, 20 plus years, I'm still looking for folks to mentor me. I remember when I first met Alex and I watched how he engaged with people, I took that and I was like, okay, those are aspects of his personality that I would love to adapt. So I think just being open to knowing that you're not perfect, you need to grow, having that growth mindset, like you said, and identifying 
the folks that have those skills and and collaborating with them, partnering with them, building long term relationships and finding those mentors. Yeah, I love that. And not just for the compliment. I think you're talking about some other Alex there. So <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of the like the mentor discovery dilemma is difficult for people to dig through sometimes. But how you phrase just if you see it, say something. Right. We had another guest on our show who who said, you know, if you have something positive to say to somebody, just say it to them. Because like, why are you holding that back? In the same way with mentorship, it's kind of like it doesn't need to be a huge formal structure. If you see somebody do something you like, go ask them how they did it or go find out what they do. I remember when I first joined, we were in this um, essentially training room internally and a, a guy stood up and presented and another person stood up and and basically asked a, a question that would be incredibly targeted and mildly it, it wasn't offensive i don't want to say that but it was just one of those things that like would rile you up if you were the person standing up there dude turned it around made a joke not about it but he just like caught it took it and then made it like the most pleasant answer possible to something i'd never seen somebody counter a directed comment like that in such a flawless way and it was something that you know i asked him afterward how did you do that? How did you handle that just from an emotional standpoint? And he and I have chatted to this day because of that. I think it's a great idea. And it's possible in our virtual world too. I think it's harder, right? Because you don't get to hang out with somebody and actually grab a coffee or what have you. But it's still possible to like witness another person's presence. I think that's great. I absolutely agree. And I can think back to early in my career where there was many instances like, you know, I love the example you gave of using humor. I think that is uh, very powerful, uh, not in a way where you're directing it at someone, but more at the situation or finding a way to make light of a difficult situation and being vulnerable in a way it can help kind of soften whatever's going on at that time. And seeing, as I mentioned early in my career, I was a consultant working under various architects and those were the folks that I kind of modeled myself after seeing how, they presented and asking them for guidance on how do I improve the things that I feel are shortcomings in my soft skills, because we've all got room to grow. So kind of identifying those and finding folks that can help with you is really going to help you grow in your career. Yeah, the concept of humor, uh, the person that you're talking to would just be like, oh, okay, they're they're normal. Let's, let's get to know. Yeah, I mean, we're all people, right? So I think that's another like core recognition of diplomacy is that you're dealing with people, right? So they have outside pressures and strictures, but they're also still people, you know, they don't, <laughs> things are funny, right? <laughs> we all have emotions. So, you know, I, I think that that's critical. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's core to building rapport and managing relationships is kind of a subset and related to, as you mentioned early on, the art of diplomacy. I think they're all related. And I like what you said, that they're just people. I find a lot of times in the professional world, f folks feel like they have to constantly be on, constantly have to be professional and keep it about the topic at hand. And I have found just over my career that even coming in, not in a stressful situation, but just coming into a meeting, an all day working session with the customer, chatting about each other's lives, putting a bit of humor in there, sets you up for the rest of it, that meeting, that event, that day to go a lot better. And I found that that also really opens the door for you to be a trusted advisor for them. You first have to be somebody that they want to hang out with, that they want to chat with, that is likable to have that opportunity to improve yourself as that technical advisor. That's a term that we use internally, you know, Microsoft quite a bit. How do we build up relationships with customers and how do we get to that trusted advisor? And, and folks immediately think it's about the data, the solution. Let's talk to you about how I can help solve your problems. But you have to be given the opportunity and a willing audience. And you do that by managing those relationships, building rapport. Absolutely. Relationships first and then data. Yes. Put that on a t-shirt. I'd buy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the disengaging thing, as we were talking through it, I was just thinking about multiple situations that I was in where we come in, we're the vendor, we're a big company. They expect us to be flawless. They spend a lot of money on Microsoft products and services. And I've been in many situations early and even as just recent as two hours ago, situations where there is an outage and the customer is upset and you're the face of the company to them. 
So they're directing all of their anger to you. Why is this happening? Why didn't we foresee this? I thought Microsoft has, you know, this amazing uptime and things like that. And early on in my career, I've been in many situations where I was so flustered from the customer being very direct and attacking that I didn't know how to handle it. And very early on, there were situations like that where I just shut down and I was like, I don't, I don't really have an answer for you. And I had to disengage to really figure out how to address this in a way that that wasn't going to seem like we were, you know, making excuses. I, I mentioned before the importance of a mentor in those situations. A lot of those situations, having a good mentor was kind of the key to the success of turning that around and then developing that skill to the point where I could handle them myself without that assistance. So, you know, situation where I had to disengage, step away and contact somebody that I know is phenomenal handling these types of situations, has been in that situation many, many times, knows how to address it, brief them on it and get their guidance. And in many of those situations, that actually helped grow the relationship with the customer because they see you. I mentioned this before about being vulnerable. They see you were vulnerable. You were exposed. You admitted that you didn't really have an answer for them. But then you compose yourself. You came back and you said, this is how we can work on it. This is how we can improve. There's many stories like that early in my career that went the same way and then ended up with a similar result. I think that that encapsulates two things really well. I, I think that's a great example of disengaging and, and seeking help. And sometimes with early in career mindsets that, that we've encountered, I feel like there is a level of, I'm supposed to know this. You know, like this was my job. Like this is why I was hired or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm here because I can do this. And so I'm supposed to be able to do this. <laughs> and to some degree, that's a fallacy because one, there's a lot of trained behaviors that a company is investing in you. But with something like this, it's like, if you don't know, don't just handle it in the dark. Go learn how to handle it well. It's a learning opportunity and it's going to be the best result for everyone else. <laughs> don't just stumble around. I think that not being afraid of asking for help like that is a really important thing because I don't think there's many situations, certainly not from school or university, anything that we've gone through outside of actual work experience that prepares you for some of the things that you run into, because you just, you don't know, like you're working with new technology, you're working with new people, you know, you, unless you have literally done this your whole life, you have never encountered this before. <laughs> so, you know, especially when you're coming out of university, I think that that is possibly something that is new for you. <laughs> I think you did a better job of summarizing my points than I did in that story. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm on the show, Ted. That's why I'm on the show. <laughs> Shifting gears a little bit, we've talked about diplomacy a lot within the context of a uh, work experience, but even just looking at it from as objective of a lens as you can, diplomacy really is about interacting with people as a whole, whether it be professionally or personally. And these items that we've talked about, whether it be influencing others, managing relationships and disengaging, how has your development of this diplomacy muscle within your workspace, uh, have you been able to bring that into your personal life as well? Has that helped influence uh, how you live day to day when you're not at work also? That's a good question. I haven't really thought about it, but I think without question it would. I mean, your personal life is always going to influence professional and there's no reason to think that, that the opposite can't be true. You're going to take these skills that you develop here and take them to your personal life. I've always been a very candid, direct person. And if I hadn't had the opportunity to I guess, get out of that mindset, have that growth mindset to improve those social skills and improve those soft skills. It absolutely translated back to my personal life. If I were to think back to maybe how I would have been without the experience that I've gotten in my career, I wouldn't probably have some of the personal relationships that I have. So I never really thought about it like that, but that's actually a great point about how it can help in all aspects of your life and not just tied to what we do professionally. I love that. So- as we wrap up here, we've got one last thing. 
to ask kind of the crux of all this conversation about diplomacy and experiences and and how to (laughs) maximize this sort of impact you can have with relationships. What is a call to action that we can leave our listeners with if you want to give some advice to an early in career member of your team right now who is looking to improve their diplomatic ability? What's the one thing that they should do today? On top of finding a mentor. I would say try to identify the resources that are out there that can help you. Experience comes with time and having a mentor is critical in in your growth, but you also need to take an opportunity to identify the resources that can help you grow on your own, whether that's books that you can read, training that you can take. As a company, we offer a lot of training and just on that topic of resource materials, there's a very old book that I think is still very beneficial for folks and it's How to Win Friends and Influence People. I think that is a great read that should be on everyone's bookshelf. There you go. And on top of that, I think uh, one of the best resources out there is uh, talking to other people and socializing, trying to gain as much perspective as possible. Because, I mean, if you want to flex this uh, this people muscle skill, building diplomacy and uh, interacting with others, go out there and talk to talk to people. <laughs> there you go. What a marvelous thought. <laughs> talk to people. <laughs> hey, kids. Crazy, right? <laughs> it's such a simple concept. It reminds me when you said that I thought back to, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Patch Adams, and he talked a bit about that, talking about talk to wrong numbers, talk to people that you run into on the street, talk to everyone. I mean, that's how you're going to build these skills. This generation that's coming out of school right now has spent a lot of time being driven by technology and knowing how to communicate through technology but not, I think, missing some of those skills that were developed prior to having those those things available to us. And uh, you're spot on with that, Zach. Uh, Just talk to people. It's such a simple concept, but talking to people will help you develop all of these skills. And on that note, thank you for talking to us, Ted. I think this is an absolutely fantastic conversation. I uh, really, really love your, your reflections and uh, all the examples that you've given. And um, I mean, I personally learn so much during uh, our talk. And I'm really, really hoping that our audience uh, feels the exact same way. So thank you for your time. Thank you guys for the invite. This was a lot of fun. And I learned from you guys too. I mean, we're sharing back and forth here. And with every insight that you gave in response to things that I mentioned, I'm taking those and learning from those. So thank you for, for, for sharing that as well. Absolutely. It's great having you, Ted. Thank you. Wow. Well, I mean, that was uh, quite the episode to to go through. I think there's lots of different nuggets to pull from, but one that stuck out the most to me is I think one that we forget a lot. And that's that it's important to remember that people are human when you walk into a situation. And specifically, he was talking about introducing humor into a situation. But, you know, a key component to successfully being diplomatic is understanding and empathizing with the person who's in the situation that is in tension and knowing how to navigate that and knowing how to be delicate, but also be helpful really comes down to remembering that the other person is human. Because at the end of the day, like you are you, you want to be treated as a human with respect and dignity. And also like if you're in a crisis, you want others to acknowledge it. So I think it's easy for us to lose Side of that when we are dealing with a situation, whether we are the person in crisis or the person handling it, it's easy to forget somebody is human to be convenient for us to deal with the situation. So I thought that was really good. What about you, Zach? I mean, humor is the best diffuser of any kind of tough situation. But the one thing that I enjoyed most about this episode, Ted gives so many concrete action items as to how to develop this diplomacy muscle and also just navigating your career as an early in career individual as a whole, like finding a mentor. Well, absolutely agree with you there. So glad we could do this episode together, Zach. For everybody out there, tune in next time. Thank you for joining us today on Upwards and uh, check out some of our other shows if you like this one. Thanks for listening to Upwards. Be sure to subscribe on your preferred podcast platform and leave us a review. Learn more about the Microsoft Aspire experience at aka.ms forward slash Microsoft Aspire experience. We'll catch you next time on Upwards.